it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's see if I can manage the technology. Uh, the title of this talk is a question. Is the future of agriculture perennial? We'll see if there is an answer, yes or no, after the talk. Um, I show some pictures of, um, of rather interesting crops that you may not have seen in this context before. Um, pigeon pea you may have seen, but maybe not the perennial version. Perennial rice, only a few people have tasted it. Um, but increasing number. Kernsa with Erik Sten Jensen in the middle of the field outside um, Ultuna and perennial wheat to the right. My point of departure, my point of departure, am I supposed to press the left or the right button? Maybe I can push this one. Could I get some help with sort of uh, changing slides? Oh, here it comes, here it comes. Okay, so my point of departure is the IPCC special report on climate change and land that was approved by governments last month. That report is, it can be seen as a reality check of the previous report that IPCC released October last year, the uh, special report on uh, 1.5 degrees warming. Because that report said three things. Among its 2,000 pages, there were three things that stood out. Every tenth of a degree matters. In other words, it's so important trying to strive for 1.5 degrees rather than two. That difference is very significant for humanity. Secondly, the report concluded that it is still biophysically possible to do so. We haven't committed ourselves to warming more than 1.5 degrees yet. It is still possible, but time is running out very, very, very quickly. Third point is, it's not enough to cut the emission of fossil fuel. Other sectors need to be engaged as well. These are the three main points. So the special report on land can be seen as a kind of reality check, because the 1.5 degrees report is very conceptual. Many of the results come out of integrated assessment models um, made by computer scientists and theoretical people with very, very vague ideas about the real-world constraint in terms of biophysics and social conditions on how land is used and managed. Um, you see, oh, here it comes. So, in essence, uh, it's 2,000 pages. Uh, I just summarize by showing one of the key um, graphics from the summary for policymakers, showing the incredible plethora of activities we can do on land to improve the land conditions in terms of its, um, its, its sort of climate resilience, in terms of it, um, its uh, contribution to mitigation of climate change, and so forth. Uh, and in essence, you can say that, thank you, uh, the report also concludes that zero hunger by 2030 is primarily a question about distribution and access to food. It's not a question about producing more food on this planet. So luckily, there is still time to rethink agriculture and substantial reform the way we produce food. I argue that we haven't fundamentally changed the way we produce food for the last 10,000 years. We are still living with the very same kind of idea for the mainstay, mainstay of our food production. About 10,000 years ago, we started to domesticate annual species, annual grasses, annual legumes. And we're still basing our food production on, on that. The problem with this is, of course, that once every year or every season, when you have double cropping seasons, you have to interrupt all the ecological processes. In Sweden, we even turn the soil upside down every, every year and severely disrupt all the ecological processes. 
If we look at natural ecosystem, you hardly find a natural ecosystem dominated by annual uh, species. There are a few, and they are scattered in the landscape, but monocultures of annual, annual um, grasses is extremely rare, and they won't be long-lived. Of the legume family, how many species are there, Eric? 15,000, 20,000? Less than 10% of them are annuals. Overnight, 92% of them are perennials. Why not use them? Can we domesticate them? With all the knowledge we have, I mean, there's a good reason why people 10,000 years ago domesticated annual grasses. They were easier to domesticate. But now we have fantastic knowledge, so perhaps we can start all over again. That's what I will be talking about. And it's not talking about a very distant future. I'm talking about 10 to 20 years. So the four points. Just talk about the many problems of annuals. Erosion. Um, it's well known that the conventional agriculture all over the world is, uh, we are losing soil very, very fast uh, from conventional tillage. Um, David Montgomery estimated it that we, have, we are losing soils at about two to three orders of magnitude faster than the natural regeneration of soils. Nutrients. Um, when we cultivate with our annual monocultures, we are usually making the soil poorer for every season. Therefore, we had to add the nutrients. But many of the nutrients, um, um, nitrogen, we lose 50% of the nitrogen we, we, we add, either to the groundwater or to the air. When we lose it to the air, it contributes to, to climate change. This is wasteful. And it's very much linked to the fact that we're using annual crops. Carbon, we're losing carbon in the soil. Uh, when we turned natural ecosystems into agricultural um, uh, systems um, over sort of the last sort of decades or, or, or centuries, we lost something like 50, sometimes 60 percent of the soil carbon. And now it's so important to take some of that carbon back because it has went up to the atmosphere contributing to climate change. The use of annual crops and frequent soil disturbing and very shallow root systems is a key reason why we lost so much carbon in the soils. Weeds is actually not a natural problem. It is produced by our overuse of annual monocultures. Because the weeds, when we open the field, we clear the field, take away all the vegetation, that's when we open up for the weeds to come in and establish themselves to thrive. If we never give the weeds a chance, they will, to establish themselves, we can solve to a large extent, the weed problem without spraying. And energy. Um, Jonathan Foley, in a seminal paper, maybe six, seven years ago, cultivation of uh, um, a cul solutions for a cultivated plant in nature, concluded that agriculture is probably the most environmentally damaging activity humanity ever invented. It produces more greenhouse gases than all the cars in the world. Uh, the conventional agriculture, a farmer will drive heavy machines over the field at least five, six times, maybe up to 10, 12, 13 times. And that consumes a lot of energy, of course. And it compacts the soils and all kinds of problems. But not only, um, not only um, environmental or biophysical problems related to the use of annuals, also many of the social problems in agriculture can actually be traced down to the use of annuals. It means that the farmers are kept in what the uh, well-known agricultural economist Willard um, Cochrane described in 1958 when he described his theory about the agricultural treadmill, how farmers are caught in a treadmill which makes them poorer and poorer the more they, they, they continue, but they can't break out of it. Uh, here we illustrate the agricultural treadmill uh, uh, from, from the United States, but the pattern is similar all over the world, where we have, I wonder if I have a, yes, I have a pointer. 
Here we show the price that far, the relative price development of produce from farms in the US, grain, grain crops. So in 1980, they got 100%. And then we've seen how the price the farmers will get for what they produce has been suppressed by or gone down to about 50%. At the same time, we see how the price of external inputs to agriculture is rising all the time. Seeds, pesticides, nutrients, uh, uh, fertilizers, and then machinery and, 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 and particular seeds and pesticides are driving um, this sort of the wheel of uh, the, the, uh, the tread because farmers had to go and buy them every year. And since they're annual, they had to go and get the herbicides or spend a lot of F, uh, machinery and labor on getting rid of, of, of the um, weeds. So many of the social and environmental problems can actually be traced down to the use of annual crops. So the solutions and co-benefits, in theory first, can it be done? Can we domesticate perennial crops? Uh, the, um, at least the modern root of the idea comes from the late, uh, mid-1980s. West Jackson, who wrote his book, New Roots for Agriculture, where he outlines his view of an agriculture that has the natural ecosystem as a model, trying to learn from that how it has evolved and learn from that when we design an agricultural system. And then there are particular two things that stand out. Perennial crops, deep and large root systems. There's no surprise that the cover of his book was primarily focusing on the roots, not what's above the ground. And diversity in space. That means the mosaic of the landscape. In agriculture, we have had a long practice of having diversity over time. We do crop sequences, crop cycles, crop rotation, which is a very good practice. But it might be an even better practice to have that diversity, not over time, but actually in space, in the landscape mosaic. So that's the primary idea, perennial polycultures instead of annual monocultures. That's the idea of West Jackson with still. And you can say that in a natural ecosystem, we have perennial high diversity. All kinds of ecosystem services will be produced by such a system. Soil formation, maximizes soil organic matter, resistant to pathogens and insects, nutrients retained, weed establishment suppressed because we never give the weeds a chance. They're always a, 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 a cover of, of, of other things. Um, there is a high functioning soil micro, my, uh, uh, microbiome. High precipitation use efficiency, no fossil fuel dependence. Especially the, the biodiversity of the soil, I think, is the key. Our agricultural soils are more or less dead from a biodiversity point of view. And if we look into a soil of a natural ecosystem, that's where we have all the biodiversity. It might be poor above ground, but it's so rich below ground. So that's the ecosystem disservice that we have for an annual low diversity. Uh, cropping, can we design, can we learn from this and design a perennial moderate diversity system that can produce food for us, we can harvest it, and it will generate many, many ecosystem services, including um, food. Let's see. Yeah. So, we can say perennial versus annual roots continue year after year, and have to start every season. Pest resistance, weeds, costs, so forth. I won't repeat it, but with all these fantastic benefits, why aren't they developed? Why haven't we seen any or more perennial grain crops developed? I think the, the reason is we have to look at politics. We have to look at the way the food system, as we heard before, how the food system is organized. Um, and it's, of course, the largest market. We all participate in it. We have 7.5 billion consumers. We have 1.5 billion producers. The tragic story is, of course, that most of the producers, well, actually, 
not most, but many of the producers are very food insecure themselves. But then we have in between the producers and consumers, we have an incredibly consolidated sector. Uh, where the economic power is actually against development of trend rates. If we start with the input companies, for example, um, if your business idea is to manage a problem, you don't want that problem to go, go away because then you lose your business. So isn't it a fantastic business idea that you manage your problem in such a way that the more you manage it, the more you need the products. This shows the increase in glyphosate resistant uh, weeds worldwide. How it, when it started uh, mid 90s, there were a few resistant weed species and it just increases exponentially. The more herbicide, the, the more glyphosate we use, the more resistance we get, the more herbicides we need to buy, the more resistance we get, and so forth. It's a fantastic business opportunity, isn't it? So it wouldn't have been such a big problem if it wasn't for the fact that the very industry controlling the agrochemicals is also to a large extent the ones controlling the seeds. So this shows, you may have heard of the recent story, how over the last decades we have seen enormous structural change in the agricultural, the, the um, um, agrochemical industrial complex, as, as sometimes we call it, of how the industry has acquired the seed industry, more or less. And the logic is, of course, simple. If you want to promote your agrochemicals, you better design the seeds. So they want, they need, they tolerate your, your, your products. And that's how we see um, this very, very strong economic tie between the, um, um, the agrochemicals and the seeds. So it shows the, um, the big con conglomerate buyer, which bought Monsanto last year, and which is now actually fighting for its existence because the bad decision to buy Monsanto. Um, eight, the latest I saw was 18,000 people are now in queue for, for suing Monsanto for causing non-Hodgkinson disease. Uh, we see, so all the red ones, they are the, the chemical companies, and in, in blue we see the seed companies. Something like between 60 and 70 percent of the seed industry where all the most of the development of seeds is done is controlled by the agrochemical industry. And of course, they are not going to develop perennial grains or perennial crops. So the research front, so can it be done? Uh, the basic idea of West Jackson back, back in, in the 1980s, when most people thought he was a lunatic, uh, or they laughed at him, I don't think anyone will laugh at West Jackson nowadays, 40 years or 40, 44 years later. When the first perennial wheat-like product is about to be released, Kerns, which is immediate, uh, the uh, intermediate wheatgrass, uh, it's a newly domesticated um, crop. It's still very much under development, but it has come that far that it's now possible to test it and grow it on perhaps um, semi-commercial uh, scale. There is a, a big estate in, in Skåne, Hergesta, one of the largest agricultural estates in Scandinavia. They uh, planted last year 25 hectares of it and they decided just to go for 50. Um, and there is an emerging market. In the US there is already um, pasta, there is a beer and so forth made from it. So it's, it's starting to take off. And this is actually Eric Sten Jensen in the middle of his trial at, at, um, at uh, Lundstorp where you try it now for four or five seasons, five years. Um, so the idea of West Jackson was, we, before we can talk about a truly sustainable agriculture, we need a perennial version of the staple food crops. We need a perennial wheat product, wheat-like product, perennial rice, perennial maize, perennial oilseed, and some perennial legumes. Wheat seems to be very promising, but there are also uh, trials that are rather successful of, of um, um, what we call wide hybridization of wheat. So um, crossing wheat, the domesticated wheat, with wild relatives to make a perennial version of wheat. But so far, I think the cancer is the, 
the, the most spectacular um, example. The root system are incredible. I will show them in scale one to one in a, in a minute. Uh, perennial oil seeds that turn out to be more challenging, but uh, they started for several, several or oh, two decades, I think, with um, with the uh, sunflower version, Helianthus. It turned out to be more more difficult than, than they thought, so they switched to. Um, uh, a reality which is Silphium integrifolium, which seems to be very promising. So within the next 10 years, I am optimistic there will be a oil, perennial oil seed available. And again, look at the roots. The roots are Im impressive. That's sort of a, a key feature of the perennial grains. Perennial rice is perhaps the biggest success story. There are already, I think um, it was early this year, or late last year, I can't remember, so less than a year ago, Two commercial varieties were released in, in China, and they are now producing perennially on par with, with the annual rice. Um, Eric and I have tasted it, and it tasted nice. Um, so no, no problem with that. And uh, there is a particular interesting thing about perennial um, rice, or two, very, one social and one climate benefit. Social benefit is, of course, the labor requirement for transplanting rice is very, very, very big. Um, and it's a very, not very healthy job. So having perennial rice is fantastic um, sort of uh, Im improvement. Um, from a climate change point of view, rice cultivation is responsible for something like 20% of the methane emission, which is a major source climate change. But the methane emission comes primarily in the early stage in rice cultivation, when you have fields waterlogged and you get anaerobic um, decomposition of the organic matter, then you get the methane. With perennial rice, you do it once and then you just continue year after year. So the perennial PR23 and 20, PR26, as they call, have been producing for, I think, seven or eight seasons now. They have two seasons, so it's but seven or eight seasons without any reduction in yield. <coughs> For tropical regions, perennial sorghum, uh, perennial pigeon peas is seen as a very, very promising intercropping, sort of a, um, the, the um, yeah, inter, in, intercropping sorghum and, 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 and <coughs> pigeon peas is a perennial bush, but most often it's used as an, as an animal. But there is, the idea is to, to use it as a, as, as a perennial. Um, sorghum is a, is a breed between the, the um, domesticated sorghum and a relative which is a very, very um, problematic weed, <coughs> uh, Johnson grass. Uh, that is a work which I think within um, five, eight, less than ten years, I think there will be a variety which is ready for uh, use uh, more um, op operational. We are testing it in Uganda among ten farmer groups. Um, so, the research landscape, is this just fantasy? Um, no, it's actually, at the moment, this is uh, half a year old, the, the map, it shows the 41 different groups around the world which are engaged in, 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 in uh, doing different parts of the work to develop perennial grains. Uh, we had a meeting in Lund in May, that was the, 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 the largest meeting of this community uh, ever. We were planning for 60 people to come, uh, but we had to put a stop at 92 because our premises were, were planned for, for 60 people and we ended up with 92. It was a very, very inspiring meeting and there is, seems to be a very, very strong momentum. The fact that um, a man named Bill Gates uh, tweeted, no, he said in an interview, the five most important innovations to save this planet, one of them was intermediate wheat kerns up. The work of the Land Institute to domesticate perennial species. That boosted the whole thing. Um, so that is the intellectual hub, the Land Institute in Kansas. But it's, it's really uh, leading, not by control and command, but by an in, sort of intellectual inspiring leader. And as I said, there are now at least 40 uh, research groups um, contributing. In Sweden, we have Lund, Alnap and Ultunap, who are 
part of, of, of this. Um, so with this, I think it's time. I have maybe a minute, do I? And perhaps I can show you what Kernsa looks like when you, when you, if I need some help here. So could, um, let's see. If you stand here, and I need one more. Uh, Eric, you are, you, you are tall. So if you, you, you hold in, in, in the middle, and, and I'll roll up. So here we show, at the top, we have the domesticated intermediate wheatgrass. Um, and besides that, we have a, um, conventional wheat. The wheat is ready to, to be harvested. The perennial wheatgrass has been here for 12 months, and it will just continue to grow and grow and grow. <laughs> I thought it was upside down, so you can't read it. So that's the end of the root system. So of course, you can imagine, with such a root system, as a very, very different ecological process in the soil. And most important is, of course, the root system of that wheat plant dies off. It has to restart again next season. This one just grows on, mm -hmm. and the adding root system. So studies have shown that the root system of, we can put it down here, uh, the root systems of Kernsa is something like between 5 and 15 times larger than, um, than annual, annual crops. And of course, that has a tremendous effect on the amount of carbon in the soil and the, um, the soil microbiota in, 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 in the soil. And to domesticate a perennial species, according to the plant breeders, there, they can conclude now there is no principle, there's nothing in principle preventing this from producing even higher yield than the annual ones. Actually, it's quite logical that it should, because what plant breeding does, in, in essence, is they reallocate the biomass from stems and leaves to seeds. And there is something like three to four times more biomass in the perennial ones <coughs> to, to reallocate. So that's the promise that we may actually... My vision is that 2070, people School kids will read about the perennial revolution in school. The perennial revolution was something that happened in the 20s, 2020, um, where scientists were able to change the cropping system. And the school kids will be amazed. How stupid could people be for 10,000 years going on with all these annual crops when we could solve so many problems with the perennial ones? So that's my vision for 2065. Thank you, and I'm ready.